All right, Madhava, well, it's good to have you back here. Um, I know 9-11 is coming up again, and uh, we're going to have a nice conversation here around 9-11, the research, what NIST says, and kind of this difficult position we're in as people where everything from experts disagree to there's an onslaught of misinformation and malinformation and all this kind of stuff, and how do we create the space and the conditions to have meaningful conversations exploring um, important topics. So let's get into this. First off, before we do, how are you doing today? Um, well, thank you for having me on. And I think you and I had a similar conversation four years ago, once again, yep. at, uh, another anniversary. And it looks like I'm getting a little bit grayer and <laughs> you're not. So um, <laughs> that's what happens. You'll Maybe find out here. in a couple of decades. Yeah, well, yeah. but um, you know, I, I want to first say that this is not just going to be another discussion about 9-11 and it being an inside job or whatever, Yeah. Um, because I would imagine that most of your audience already understands that there was some massive deceptions behind that story. Yeah. And the intent here is not to prove to your audience that there's some misdirection around the conventional narrative. I'm hoping that we can put together something that is shareable. Because right now, in our world, people are willing to shift their opinion about many, many different things. I mean, we're in a much different position than we were four years ago because we just went through four years of a pandemic and people are starting to realize that you can't trust uh, the same sources that you've been trusting your whole life because yeah. they're clearly caught in lies. And my point here is that all of you folks out there that happen to be listening to this, it's not about talking you into a new position, I'm hoping that we can put together something of value that you can share with people who are starting to wake up to something that could be liberating for the for humanity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm hearing this as how do we create a, a meaningful platform to make sense of this in a way that is not ideologically driven, but just looking at what we actually know or don't know and bring more aspects of the narrative together that often are not considered. And I think this is exactly. the way I like to put it is you can have four of 10 facts and not know that there's six more mm -hmm. and that will produce a narrative. But the moment you bring in those other six, that narrative can no longer be what it is, but you also cannot ignore those six and still say that this is it. Right. And so mm -hmm. I, I think what you're going to offer from, from the little chit chats that we had are pieces that many people may not have heard about that you cannot ignore. Right. And they're not crazy right. ideas. They're very basic and in, in, in grounded in science. So yeah, it'll be interesting to, uh, to dive in. Why don't we begin with, um, some of the thoughts you had there on like kind of this moment of fake news, misinformation, and, and that kind of culture that's been, been being pushed and almost weaponized. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, as we were recording this a couple of weeks before the 23rd anniversary, there's a lot, lot going on here politically in this country, and I know most of the world is looking at our country, the United States, with a, a large amount of scrutiny as to what's going to happen here. And I've been approached uh, by many people recently about Kennedy's move to support the Trump campaign. Yeah. Like, why is he doing this? And... What it really comes down to is, I would say, first of all, his commitment to children's health, as well as the First Amendment, which yep. is the freedom of expression. And this is being attacked in our country at, at a level I've never, ever seen before. And what I want to first offer you, uh, your audience, is this. We have, if you go and Google, how do I spot fake information or you know, fake news, misinformation, you will see a huge number of websites, many of them academic, many of them coming from governmental agencies that describe a pathway to make sense of what you're being told, because this is an important aspect of what's happening right now. Misinformation, malinformation, disinformation, these are all spelled out with detail in our own Department of Homeland Security, because misinformation and the spreading of misinformation and disinformation is being considered domestic terrorism and terrorist activities from the Patriot Act 
allows our government to take extraordinary action against such threats. So all of this is combined into one morass of confusion that has very, very powerful and serious consequences. So let's look at uh, what I'd like to show for you first, which is how a governmental agency of many mm -hmm. describe a method of getting through fake news and misinformation. And this is coming from NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric uh, Association, which is a scientific uh, part of the U.S. government. And I'm going to go through these quickly and ask you for your response about how you uh, re would regard this. And I'm going to, you know, offer you my own thoughts as I'm, I'm speaking this out. Yeah. But <clears throat> again, this is from um, NOAA. And 10-step process they offer, right? Number yep. one, do a visual uh, assessment. In other words, look at the site itself. Fake news sites often look amateurish have lots of annoying ads, and use altered or stolen images. I think that's pretty good advice. There are a lot of websites out there that claim to be authentic but aren't. Wouldn't you agree? 100%. I think it's reasonable, although I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't shoot a messenger just because they couldn't put a good site together, but it's a great place yeah. to start. Yeah, this is something to keep in mind. It doesn't mean uh, that it, they're all wrong, but that's something to look out for. Yeah. Check the web domain. In other words, the URLs, do they end with .com, .co, or .lo? Yeah. And uh, these are used to mimic legitimate news sites. So does the URL seem legitimate? I think that's good advice. Yep. Again, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're just trying to uh, find uh, something that would make us look a little bit harder. Very good advice. Check the About Us section. Trustworthy news outlets usually include detailed background information and policy statements and email contacts. So I think that's very important information because they need to tell us who they are, who is actually saying this. Uh, number four, um, if there's no author names given, that's a uh, reason to be suspicious. And I agree with that. You? I, yeah, I do. I, I think this other part is interesting to mention, you know, search them online to see if he or she is well known or respected. And I think the, the challenge with that part is, I mean, it's so easy for Google to it, it completely eliminate people, eliminate search results. And so right. um, it's, it's hard to, to know, to know if you can find somebody who's well known or respected. I mean, we saw that where yeah. we used to get, you know, 40, 50,000 hits a day from Google, and then they removed us, and suddenly we were getting like 1,000 hits a day from Google, so. Um, Correct. Yeah, you're yeah. making a very good point, which is, you know, already we are seeing the uh, spin here because it's, it's yeah. the mainstream media that legitimizes a person. Yeah. So already we should be scratching our head, like how do we know uh, if someone is well-respected? Yeah. Um, number five, assess spelling, grammar, and punctuation. I think that's reasonable. Mm. Number six, identify the central message and read the article carefully. And fake news articles often push one viewpoint and have an angry tone or make outrageous claims. That's reasonable too. I really believe that if someone yep. is interested in, in conveying legitimate information that's factual or at least thought to be f factual, there's no reason to be angry because that sounds more like a, you know, a Facebook post or something or, a, yep. you know. Number seven, analyze sources and quotes. Consider the article's sources and who is quoted. Fake news articles often cite anonymous sources, unreliable sources, or no sources at all. Yeah. So I think it's very important to include citations and links so you can go and check. Yeah. Um, but already they now are introducing something very interesting, which is um, – uh, does the article include and identify reliable sources? Mm -hmm. So how do we know if something is reliable or not? We're, we're yeah. just sort of left to our own to decide that, right? Yep, 100%. So, right. Now, here we go. Eight, find other articles and search the internet for more articles on the same topic. If you can't find any, chances are the story is fake. Are there multiple articles by other news outlets on this topic? What do you say to that, Joe? Well, so 
you know, they're pointing to something here that I think is, is somewhat uh, worth mentioning, which is that, I mean, we, we saw this way back in the day, would be um, a guy that was kind of in our field, actually used to, to, to make up a lot of bullshit articles and, um, and put them out there. And of course, they were always anonymous statements and, oh, Mel Gibson said this or this person said that. And so they're pointing to like, you know, fake articles and how to, you know, determine what could be fake. But fake is very, very different than something that just may not be as true or maybe offers a different, you know, sort of perspective on things. And I think that this is where the baby goes out with the bathwater and a lot of stuff is that we're using the word fake um, when it comes to news way too often mm -hmm. when in reality it's, it's, um, it's a difference of perspectives and yeah. you know, so. Well, but here they're saying something very specific, which is if you can't find other articles, yeah, then it's, that's an indication that it's fake. If you can't find other people who say the same thing and yeah. they're introducing a distortion here, which is, yeah, if there are a lot of people saying the same thing. It must be true. Yes, there's Maybe. that too. That's what I'm saying here is that they are, uh, you know, introducing the idea into our our minds that um, the more people <clears throat> that agree with a statement, the more likely it is to be true. That is ne not necessarily true. That's all I'm trying to say with this statement here. Yeah. It's it's you know you can't make that assumption, especially in today's world. They're they're um, discounting the possibility that many people could be wrong. Yeah. Number nine. <clears throat> Here's where it gets even more fascinating. Identify the news outlet. The Wall Street Journal and CNN are examples of news outlets. If yeah. you haven't heard of the news outlet, search online for more information. Is the news outlet well-known, well-respected, and trustworthy? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, <laughs> what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, – let's go back to uh, NewsGuard, right? I mean – right. New, like if people want to think about how the infrastructure for this works, okay, so NewsGuard comes along. They are a, um, a essentially a mainstream sort of a news analysis, um, like so a news website analysis company who is going to say who is trustworthy and who's not, and they come up with their own devised rating system for yeah. who is trustworthy and who's not. And then Google is on their side in terms of yeah. promoting them higher up in the algorithm when you search for something. So mm -hmm. the problem here is, is that, you know, who's defining, who's deciding, who's respected and trustworthy and blah, blah, blah. It's the same apparatus that is then ultimately, you know, messing with the algorithms to make it, to make, to make things pop up that, that they want to pop up. And if you don't actually take the time to go and look like who is trustworthy, who is, who is giving you a proper narrative and, and kind of figuring that out on multiple layers, then yeah, you're just going to trust whatever something tells you because you're assuming that Google and other things are just going to give you accurate results, which is the problem. That's yeah. the problem that's being pointed out, but nobody's really um, getting that on the mainstream side. Well, more importantly, you know, as importantly, they're explicitly giving you examples of the Wall Street Journal yeah. and CNN. You know, a priori, they can be trusted. Yeah. That is, in my mind, a, a big warning sign. Like, why, why CNN? Um, and, you know, why didn't you mention Fox News? Not, I'm not saying that Fox News is more reliable. I'm just saying that why those? So yeah. they're inherently biasing us with this uh, purported, uh, you know, advice. But finally, I'll go to the last point. Number 10, turn to fact checkers. Factcheck.org. Snopes.com, oh, PolitiFact.com are widely trusted fact-checking websites. Do the fact-checkers say the news story is true? Now, like I think they basically showed their, their cards with, mm -hmm. um, with that statement. Now they're telling you, look, when all else fails, we have these websites out there that can tell you what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. And – Right, like Snopes.com. Like, like, honestly, what do people think that there are a bunch of PhDs sitting around with nothing to do but make sure everything is correct on a website? Who do you think is paying these people? And are, are they really reliable uh, and unbiased 
quote unquote fact checkers. I mean, is, is, do you really think it's that simple? I don't. It's oh, absolutely. And I mean, Snopes is obviously I mean, they make tons of mistakes. I mean, PolitiFact made a whole bunch of mistakes over COVID. Um, and a lot of times it's armchair scientists, right? Different people that they bring into the picture. Um, also, they stealth edit a lot. So when they do get things wrong, um, which they do a lot, or when they realize, I remember the classic one was the aluminum and vaccine um, discussion. Yeah. All the fact checkers were going to university scientists and the university scientists were saying things like, oh no, and you get the same amount of aluminum when you're eating a canned food as you do in, in the injection. And it's like, did you guys even read the article? The article explicitly talks about how injected aluminum is different than ingested aluminum. And mm -hmm. I bring this up just to say that a lot of these fact checkers are providing a cursory overview of a particular subject. It's not like they are deep experts that are actually trying to make sense of the different perspectives coming to the table. They're just yeah. trying to uphold the existing widely accepted view. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem with fact checkers on controversial topics is that while they can point out the facts on something that is very uh, obviously wrong, and that's great, yeah. They get a lot of the important conversations where experts disagree. They they get it wrong. Yeah, they get it wrong. And, you know, I, I don't know how many conversations you and I have had over the last four years about um, stuff that you and I have put together and then was fact-checked and yeah. uh, how much time you wasted going back and forth with these people <laughs> trying to convince them that they have it wrong, actually. But yeah. they're introducing something, again, which is you can trust people. You yeah. can trust people, which is – you know, there's no reason to make that assumption. And w what I'm trying to say here is that this sort of public service announcement coming from our government, in this case, is actually a form of misinformation itself. And it's very pernicious because it, it offers some good advice mixed with very bad advice. Yeah. You know, there's no reason for us to trust these, uh, these organizations, but we're being asked to accept them as reliable and almost, you know, irrefutable or irreproachable because they want us to give them the ultimate say on these matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why it's a very, very dangerous piece of inf information, interestingly, uh, of misinformation coming from uh, being sold to us as a way to identify misinformation. Yeah. It's not empowering. Right. That's another detail to this, right? Is That's right. Yeah. You're just being told, go listen to what these people say. And um, I'm sure we'll kind of get into that in terms of the experts question, maybe a little bit, but there's an, uh, there's an element, there's a theme in this world right now that people desperately need to understand. And it's that yeah. we are in a position where you can't just believe what experts say, because that is the point of what we're going through is like, things don't make sense anymore because there's a, a battle of narratives because we, yeah, we have had a lot of things wrong for a really long time. And so what mm -hmm. we need are empowering steps right now, not, hey, just go believe that person. That's not critical thinking in a sense, but it also brings up a really difficult thing for the average person who only has 10 minutes to make sense of something because they don't have time. Is like, how mm -hmm. are they actually supposed to navigate this, right? Which is, yep. I'm sure we'll get there. Yeah, we're gonna get there. And if you were just to accept this as the way, yeah. what are they actually telling us to do here? They're basically saying that there are trusted sources and you can identify misinformation when the information does not uh, resonate with what the trusted sources are saying. Yeah. And this is not a formula for thinking rationally. This is yeah. actually a formula for dogma. Yeah, because that's what dogmatic yeah. thinking is. How do you know that, you know, uh, there, there's a false prophet? Oh, it's because they, they'll disagree with us. That does not, <laughs> you know, get you to the truth. This, this will get you to believe in a system of thinking that is being imposed yeah. upon you. 100%. Anyway, yeah. right. So in contrast, I would like to offer you a 12-step process that I use. And I'm just going to go through these 12 steps um, labeled A through L. And 
apply this to the 9-11 story. That's what I'd like to do in the first part of our conversation. Is that all right? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Number one, embrace uncertainty. And we'll talk about this later. Yeah. Number two, sharpen your powers of observation. Number three, use your imagination as a tool. Hmm. Four, familiarize yourself with relevant scientific principles. Five, this is very important, go to the source documents themselves, not third-party analyses of them. Yeah. Six, identify the central questions and understand how they're being answered by the narrative that's being offered to you. Uh, eight, assess the initial coverage of an event. And then nine, compare that to the narrative that is being promulgated. Uh, identify any contraindication, uh, contradictions. And now I'm on 10. Identify a better alternative explanation. 11. Figure out who benefits from the narrative, i.e. Mm -hmm. qui bono. And then 12. Contextualize what this all means in your understanding of uh, a larger uh, uh, context in yeah. how you believe things actually fit together. So those are my 12 steps. And what I would like to um, do now is note, first of all, that nowhere in those 12 steps have I asked you to trust a third party. It's all about self-empowerment, about taking agency in understanding uh, what you're being given. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so the responsibility is with us. Yeah. So, and also I want to be very clear that I'm not saying that you need to trust me. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying use this and see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, then throw it away and find a better way. So I'm not an authority on sense making, I'm just saying this is what I use. Yeah. Okay. So now, are we ready? We're gonna hit the topic of 9-11, which I think is uh, a very vital, I don't wanna say important, but you know, <laughs> a, uh, a narrative that if you really get to the bottom of this, it is the thread which will offer the greatest benefit once you tug on it in terms of uh, reframing your understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. Sound good? Yep. So the first step was embracing uncertainty. And I, I really like this because this is exactly how you advise your readers every time you post something, right? Like, what, what do you say? Like, take a deep breath. Yeah, the idea is to sort of set your pulse is what we talked about on the set pulse. Your, but right. when we started using it with collective evolution back in the day, yeah, the, the general idea is to get somebody to just slow down and slow down physiologically. And, and we're trying to break the habit too of just going through content, 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 which, you know, obviously kills out people's ability to kind of make sense of things. But also, we're trying to get people to feel internally and become curious about that. So if you're kind of triggered by a piece of information or feeling like, Ooh, that, that, that bugs me. Take note of that. That's an interesting signal, not of your intuition telling you what the truth is, but where you actually might be having something push back against your own ideas and that you have to get curious about that. Right. But that's kind of the mm -hmm. idea. Yes. I, I love that. And you know, there, there are, <clears throat> There are certain kinds of things uh, that we can sort of categorize in terms of how we know something. And I would say there, it's either based in personal experience. Nobody is going to be able to convince you that you're not having pain if you're having pain. You know that. That is something that's irrefutably true. But here we're talking about a narrative, right? There is... Um, we're using thought forms, we're using an understanding. So it's uh, it's not easy to be very, very certain of something when we're talking about a story. Yeah. And my question that I, I would ask people uh, would be, what would it take to change your mind about what you believe on the subject to begin with, a priori, with regard yeah. to 9-11? And... Uh, is it based in your own experience? Probably not, because, you know, how is anyone going to, like, f fully understand what happened on 9-11, uh, even if you were there at the time? Is it based in scientific principles? Or is it based in trust in a third party? And 
more often than not, when I speak to you know qualified individuals, people who are engineers or architects who believe the conventional narrative about 9-11, more often than not, they will say that they will believe my understanding or my explanation when the New York Times backs me up. Yeah. Which is very interesting, right? Because they are giving, they are outsourcing their ability to make sense of it to a third party. And the yeah. third party may be fallible. And the, the point here is not to say that the third party is wrong. I'm just saying that there must be some element of uncertainty uh, that gets introduced when you believe in a third party. And this offers an opening to, yeah. to be flexible in what you're being uh, told. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, <clears throat> number two, sharpen your powers of observation. And so what I'd like to uh, offer your viewers here who are watching this is a picture. I will um, frame this, letting you know that this obviously is one of the Twin Towers blowing up. This is the North Tower, uh, which was the first tower that was struck and the second tower that fell. And we, this is a frame taken from a nine or 10 second uh, long sequence. And let's just look at this for, for a moment. And my question to you is, is this building blowing up or falling down? What does it look like? And obviously, uh, you know, people who have looked at this and understand that, the, um, that they were being demolished will say, oh, it's being demolished. But people who think that it's falling down will say, well, it's falling down. But what do we actually see here? And, you know, what I see here, and you can tell me if this uh, makes sense with you, I see that there's smoke and there's debris. Yeah. Like the stuff on top is, you know, rising because it's, it is, you know, uh, light and it's going up. This could be from fires for sure. It could be a little bit of uh, dust, but there is a, a significant fraction of the building that is creating this mushroomy like um, cloud at the top of the building and it's falling down. Would you agree with that? And the reason why this is important, because I don't want us to just dismiss our eyes. We, we have eyes. We've been given eyes. We've been given the power to observe. And um, when someone says, well, you can't trust your eyes, well, you can't trust someone who tells you you can't trust your eyes, honestly. You, gotta, you, you have to first put some faith in, in what you see. And there's another very important thing that is actually not seen here, which is Where's the top part of the building? If the top part of the building is crushing the bottom part, then where is it? I don't see it. I'm not saying that we, you know, maybe it's being obscured, but it's not obvious that it yeah. is there. Yeah. And that should pose, uh, that should give us reason to pause. That's all I'm offering here. So this is where I, you know, like to bring up the next thing. Uh, you know, I, I want you to play the video from where this has been taken. But before I say that, I would ask now you to use your imagination um, and look at that for one more second. Once again, if you look closely at this video, I, will, I would suggest that you see the top of the building initially, yeah. then the collapse sequence begins. And what I see is that the top of the building starts to get demolished first. Yeah. It is, it is shrinking but the, 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 the crush zone, if you will, has not moved. To me, it looks like the top of the building is being crushed. First, yeah. possibly the entire uh, segment is being demolished. And moreover, I would like to ask your audience or ask you to use your imagination and say, what would it look like if the building was being blown up? Let's, let's, if, if you think that the building is falling down under its own weight, let's say, yeah. what then would it look like if it was being blown up from the top down? And this is why your imagination is very important because I would say it would look just like that. Yeah. As I mean, it's floor by floor, it's going to be, you know, uh, ejecting tremendous amounts of uh, material outward and it will continue to fall. And this is not so easy to do because we don't really have any um, reference 
for what it would look like. You have to use your imagination because typically building demolitions don't blow the building up from the top down. They sort of blow the building up from the bottom up or at least synchronously, uh, which will allow the weight of the building to displace it on supporting uh, infrastructure and uh, allow the uh, the weight of the building to dismember it as it's coming down. So buildings aren't typically blown up like this. It's it's much harder because it would require uh, more energy in the uh, in the explosives. Yeah. And so this would be an odd thing, but if that's what were were being done, I think that's exactly what it would look like. Yeah. Moreover, if that's what's being happening, if that's what's happening, and they're using uh, highly energetic explosives to take this down, we would expect then there would that there would be a lot of material that is being blown laterally. Yeah. And this is something to keep in mind as we go through the evidence. Yeah. Okay. Now, we are at uh, uh, step four, which is to familiarize yourself with the relevant scientific principles. And here again, this is something that... Um, we're being told, you know, at least in the last four years, well, you can't, you, you really, if as a lay person, you cannot really understand the science, you have to trust the science. And again, I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm saying that you have to do the work to understand what the scientific principles are that are in play at this point. And this is a very um, basic element of uh, science, which are called the laws of motion that were defined by Sir Isaac Newton. And the third law is applicable here, which is um, every action uh, results in an opposite reaction. But that's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're, we're talking about the fact that if the top part of the building is crushing the bottom part, it is exerting force on the bottom part. And Newton is telling us that for for every pound of force that is being applied to the bottom part, there must be an equivalent force in the opposite direction. If the building is not moving, so if there's you know force coming down and force coming up, the building should not move. But we're seeing the building collapse. So the the bottom part we're being told is crushing. Uh, the top part is crushing the bottom. The problem here is that if enough force is being applied to the bottom part to crush to crush it, an equivalent force must be being applied to the top. The top part cannot crush the bottom part without being crushed itself. And, it, you know, it, a, a, an easier way to, to, to consider this is to consider an example where you have a brick and you're trying to crush it. What kind of tool would you use? Well, you would choose a tool that was stronger than brick. You wouldn't choose an axe made out of brick because every time you struck the brick with another brick hard enough to make the brick collapse or crush, the brick that you're using would also get crushed. There's no way around this. This is how the world works. So this is the central question, is how did our authorities explain how the top part could have crushed the bottom part without being crushed itself? This is the central question um, that we want to answer, which is, you know, step F, if you will, which is, you know, step six. But in order to answer the question, which is what did our authorities say, you must go to the document itself. What are, what, what are the source documents? And this is where uh, I would say the majority of people um, are uh, negligent in their own investigation is that they haven't actually read the official explanation. They're referring to other people, whether that be popular mechanics or the guy that, you know, fixes your roof, who has, you know, more knowledge about this. And he says that it's all been explained. Is it explained? Well, we're going to find that out right now. Like, so it's super clear on that yeah. scientific example. Um, essentially, the official explanation is saying that it's the it's the top parts of the buildings that just kept falling and knocking out the bottom ones one at a time, all the way down, right? Yes, and more or less, that's what it says. Right, mm -hmm. and and you're suggesting that well, if the top part of the building began hitting these other floors, the top part would have destroyed itself in the process because they would be destroying if it each was other. Destroying the bottom floors, it would have to be destroyed. 
Right. And so you can only imagine that maybe a couple of floors could have been crushed by the top, not the entire building, because you'd run out of force. Uh, yes. Well, if, 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 it, if the top part crushed two floors, then, it, then the top two floors out of the top would have to have been crushed. Right. More or less, basically. Yeah. So and the point is, you, know, is you, it, can't, you can't keep crushing, you know, say 90 floors with only four, as, a, as an example. Yeah. You right. can't, it's impossible. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, and I, I want to address a common misconception, which is it's a difference which thing is in motion. You know, it's like, oh, if something is hitting something, it's going to destroy it. Yes, if it does destroy it and it's made of the same stuff, it too will get destroyed. It doesn't matter which thing is static and which thing is dynamic. Yeah. Both would get destroyed, right? Yeah. Um, and moreover, you know, the, the key point here is that we're talking about the same building. It's made out of the same stuff. It's not, yeah. you know, a, um, a grape hitting Kevlar. <laughs> we're talking about two things that are identically um, constructed. And it, on top of that, the bottom part of the building is designed more sturdily than the top part because it was designed to hold more weight. So yeah. as you go down in the building, the the columns are thicker yeah. because they had to support more weight. So it, it's yeah. even more absurd. And so this is the central question. And let us see how NIST explains this. This is the central question I had when I first looked at the source document, NC Star 1, the uh, final report on the collapse of the World Trade Center towers. How do they explain this? So now we're going to uh, refer to uh, the actual document itself. And yes, you have that right there. And so this is what, this is their explanation. And I have it circled. The downward movement of this structural block, and by structural block, they're referring to the top part of the building, was more than the damage structure could resist and global collapse began. So, is there an explanation there? No. They're just saying that that's what happened. There's no explanation. So, and, and this is what they say for both towers, the North Tower and uh, the South, uh, South Tower. Um, exa exactly the same verbiage. The downward movement of the structural block was more than the damaged structure could resist, and the the global collapse began. And, and there is actually another uh, distortion there, which is the damaged structure could resist. What are they referring to? They're re referring to the bottom part of the building. Now, again, look at your use your powers of observation. Does it look damaged? It didn't. It looked completely solid. And in fact, you know, we would expect that most of the damage would have been in the upper part of the building because it had been burning for anywhere between 45 minutes to about an hour and a half. Um, and fires, the heat moves upward, Yeah. right? Heat and rises. Did, so, Didn't they offer, um, if I remember correctly, this idea that, that the jet fuel would have sort of run down the columns and that's what they yes. were trying to offer? Did the, is, that, is that the case or am I, am I imagining that? Well, NIST specifically says that the majority of the, of the jet fuel was detonated on uh, impact uh, collision. Yes. Okay. And they 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 don't say exactly how much uh, specifically was left. They do say that most of it burned within ten minutes. Yeah. Um, but you know, people are walking around with the idea that the jet fuel went down the elevator shafts and started burning. You know, the from the bottom up. You don't know that for sure. I'm not saying that that's impossible and that's absurd. I do think it's rather absurd, but um, they don't have any proof of this. They're just saying, well, you know, maybe that's what happened. There's no proof of that. So let's see here. Um, so the central question is, why was the downward movement of the structural block more than the uh, damaged structure could resist? They don't explain it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think I'm I'm misleading you, look at this next excerpt, okay? This is from the executive summary of the findings. The most important part of this entire technical series of technical documents that exceed over 10,000 pages is in this footnote. And um, I'm going to read it to your audience in case it's impossible to see. Um, the focus of the investigation was on the sequence of events from the instant of aircraft impact to the initiation of collapse for each tower, 
for the brevity in this for brevity in this report, the sequence is referred to as the probable collapse sequence, although it includes little analysis of the structural behavior of the tower after the conditions for collapse initiation was were reached and collapse became inevitable. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> They're saying that some sort of initial conditions were reached and the collapse was inevitable. Yeah. But there's no analysis of this behavior. Yeah. None. They are explicitly telling you that they're not answering the question as to why. They're yeah. just saying, well, that's what happened. So uh, that's it. What's, what's left to explain? So the entire um, Twin Tower analysis can be uh, boiled down to, to this. You know, the, the question is, why did the Twin Towers fall? Oh, it's happened. because they were hit by planes. And how do we know? that it wasn't something else? Well, it's because after the planes hit, the buildings fell. Yeah. That is the 9-11 investigation. That was NIST's investigation. That's the summary. They yeah. did not explain why. I'm not making this up. They're telling you explicitly that there was little analysis. And by little, they mean zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move forward. Any other thing you want to say there? No, I just, you know, again, I think this is... Um... This is the level of sense making that sometimes is required when it comes to these sorts of events. I mean, the obvious thing is it's very difficult for somebody to go through this type of material and fully understand what they're looking at. And I think this is where the failure of our collective intelligence is coming in is that the experts or people who do have the capacity to do this type of analysis uh, are not included, are not being uh, given fair uh, voice. They are not, uh, they don't have a seat at the table uh, when it comes to this stuff. And so the people who don't have the capacity, both in time and knowledge and expertise, are then just being told to go back to the beginning of this video that, uh, you know, trust reliable sources. And, um, and the reliable sources have a narrative that, that is incomplete and doesn't make sense. Um, so, mm -hmm. It's a conundrum when you really think about it um, that we're in right now, but, uh, yeah. but, but let's continue on. Let's continue on and I want to say one more thing here, which is you don't have to be a, a physicist or an engineer to realize that they did not do an investigation. I think this is a, a major, major deficiency in people's understanding of this event is that they think that it's been explained that the experts explained it. No, they're explicitly telling you that they're not offering you an explanation. <laughs> so, you know, just drop that idea. It doesn't yeah. matter if you know what Newton's laws are. They're telling you they did not do an investigation. Now, I would really, I hope we can uh, play this and we only need to play maybe two or three minutes of this. This is extremely, extremely um, uh, useful. And this is how mainstream media were reporting what was happening that morning before yeah. the spin occurred. Do you think you could play that, Joe? But as I was looking up, I saw the entire explosion. It looked exactly like the first two, but we certainly had the most perfect vantage point for that explosion. It was unbelievable. And there has just been a huge explosion. We can see uh, a billowing smoke rising. And I can't, I'll, I'll tell you that I can't see that second tower. We're not sure exactly what happened, but it was another explosion on the far side of one of the buildings from where we're standing. The, ver the, the reverberation and another explosion on the right-hand side. Watch the right it's side. exploding. On the far side of the building, there seemed to be another explosion, and also on the right-hand side. There was also another explosion. We're not sure if that was uh, extra reverberation from what happened at the World Trade Center or if that was an added explosion. We heard a very loud blast of explosion. We looked up. And the uh, building literally began to collapse before us. Uh, again, there has been a second explosion uh, here in uh, Manhattan at the, at the Trade Center. We are, and uh, believe it or not, there was another major explosion. The build, the building itself, literally the top of it, came down, sending smoke and debris everywhere. Do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like it. To me, it sounded like. An explosion, a huge explosion, a huge rumbling cloud. We're taking photographs and securing this area just prior to that huge explosion that we all heard and felt. But it literally exploded and came down as though it had been hit. We heard an explosion. 
the explosion happened was shooting pieces of the plane. There are pieces of the plane on Church Street. Uh, there's another explosion as we speak. Something either exploded or fell off the side of the one building that was attacked. Then the entire top of the building just blew up. Just seconds ago, there was a huge explosion, and it appears right now the second World Trade Tower has just collapsed. So, um, yes. So th that was a montage of 36 uh, mainstream media outlets all reporting explosions. And of those 36, 21 of them were eyewitness eyewitness uh, accounts in real time. They were not saying that somebody heard the explosion. They're saying, oh my gosh, there are explosions occurring right now. I'm watching them or sensing them. And 15 of them were narrative reports. In other words, uh, the, the journalist was saying, we just uh, were told that there were explosions. So this is what they were saying across the board. And you saw that it was not just Fox or CNN. It was everybody was saying this. MSNBC, CNN, everybody was saying, holy moly, these explosions are occurring pretty much at the uh, point just before or during the collapse. There were explosions occurring. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have that. We have now the initial coverage. Moreover, a, uh, a very, very... Um, powerful voice in the truth movement, the late Graham McQueen, took a lot of time to compile a list of first responders' accounts, which were taken in by the New York Times in terms of um, a compilation of oral testimonies. And he found that 113 firefighters, all unprompted, said that they experienced explosions. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was another uh, three dozen or so other uh, people who also, they were not firefighters, who also said that they experienced explosions. So there is an enormous amount of uh, testimony to explosive events during the collapse sequences, mainly. Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's look at what happened a day later. And um, this is... Uh, something that we showed your viewers at uh, The Pulse a couple of years ago, yeah, or maybe three years ago, in 2021, I think. And this happens to be an actual uh, picture of the late edition New York Times, September 12th. This is the day after. Yeah. Now, w what I want to bring to your attention is this. Um yeah, the top, this is page A3. Joe, tell us about page A3. You're the one that uh, informed me about this. Well, um, if I recall the sort of um, the detail. Well, in terms of the importance of the story yeah. that's given to A3, yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, this is obviously a, a, a very, when it comes to journalism, it's like one of the, you know, important pieces to the puzzle. If you're If you're able to front and center something like this like that's a big deal and obviously you want to have as many facts and as many uh points of clarity and as much research into it as possible and when you look at the the, the lengthiness of what they've tried to offer and how deep their explanation is it's bizarre that they would have been able to put this together in less than 24 hours because when you consider it and we've all seen it in the famous movies right uh the, the journalists working really really late so that they can get the the paper in so that those big massive machines can start running and printing the paper so they can get them on the trucks and then the trucks go and deliver them right so right. everybody knows that even though this landed in a news uh box on the 12th um, there would have had to have been an immense amount of work done prior to that to get this level of, of clarity on a story. And, and I call bullshit on them being able to yeah. pull together something uh, of like, could they have offered a, a flimsy explanation based on this? Absolutely. But should we take it as fact and as serious? No, I don't think we should. Exactly. So uh, well said. And A3 is reserved for parts of the story that are extremely important because yeah. it is the second most viewed page in a uh, published uh, in a publication after the front page. Yeah. So you turn the page and this is what you're looking at. And uh, yes, I call bullshit too, primarily because, um, first of all, they have a an very accurate and detailed cross section of a floor of the Twin Tower, yeah. um, which lends a, a tremendous amount of credibility to what they're saying. Then, in that little segment in the lower right-hand corner, 
they are giving you kind of a, you know, a, a cartoon version of what we all saw. Yeah. Nobody is going to deny that that's what it looked like. And then they're telling you that it's all explained. You know, the the title of that article is Towers Believed to be Safe Proved Vulnerable to an Intense Jet Fuel Fire Experts Say. In that headline, they are instilling us with a yeah. story. Number yeah. one, it's proved. Yeah. There's no way, you know, you, you might have believed they were safe, but no, we proved that they were vulnerable. To what? An intense jet fuel fire. How do they know there was not something else there? They don't know. It's, it must have been the jet fuel. There's no proof of that at this point. This is the next day. Experts say. So now we have the, you know, authentication of the story because experts say that. What experts? How could they possibly know yeah. that there was no other mechanism of collapse in play? They couldn't. And um, in that graphic there with the uh, cross-section of the Twin Towers, they give you a five-step simple synopsis of what happened and i won't have i don't have to read it to you i think i have it there in the text for you to read but they're basically telling you that the planes hit the jet fuel was ignited uh fire protection um and sprinklers were no longer in effect and you you saw a, a collapse that's basically what the 9 11 i mean the nist technical explanation said uh three years, four years later in 2005, when they released their uh, final report on the Twin Towers, nothing is different. It's basically the same thing. And the, why that's important is that we are given the explanation up front on day two. Yeah. And then when we hear the official explanation, it matches what we thought initially. So, you know, first impressions are, are very, very large and they're giving you what the story is on September 12th. Yeah. And, you know, for the sake of it, like you're, you're playing devil's advocate for a second here and you're going, okay, you're the New York times and you're really trying to offer something to people who are shocked and, um, you know, wanting to know yeah. what the hell happened, what's going on, you know, all these details. And you're saying, oh, you know, let's let's come up with something. Let's get let's get half the floor working on a on, <laughs> on this story, and um, and really just try and get an explanation. And you you know you could forgive, for example, um, the fact that okay, well maybe they got the experts. They they kind of could, and and you know maybe okay, fine. Um, this explanation that they offered, it kind of makes sense. I mean, you could visibly see how eh, maybe that makes sense. Um, you know these sorts of things. But what kills me, and I think this is what um, people are missing, right, is because what I just said is, yeah, it's reasonable to think that they could have, that this is all in good faith. Um, it's the fact that there's so many, it goes back to the thing I said at the beginning, there's so many other facts that are not allowed to be part of the conversation as we learned more. It's classic mm -hmm. that as we learn more, we gain more refinement and clarity on the, the answer. Um, yeah. And there are just so many facts, which I'm sure you're going to kind of get to, that are not included in this. And this is why, there, you know, it, it's such yeah. a problem when it comes to 9-11 is like those experts said that, but a whole bunch mm -hmm. of other experts said other things that no one's allowed to talk about. That is exactly right. Um, so what, what's missing from here? Well, like you said, the other experts. Who? What other experts? Well, did they quote the chief architects of the Twin Towers, um, John uh, Skilling and Leslie Robertson, who have gone on record uh, before 9-11, uh, saying that these structures were built to sustain not one but two passenger planes, commercial aircraft collisions. Mm -hmm. They're not quoted. Yeah. Number two... What about all of the mainstream media coverage of explosive events? Explosions are not mentioned anywhere in this article that's supposed to give you the final say, basically, on why these buildings came down. Missing. And finally, why did this story appear on page A3? Well, I think we can infer that people were scratching their heads saying, how could that possibly happen? Like. In, like they knew there was doubt in the public's mind as to 
the the validity of what their own eyes were telling them. Yeah. The the you know these two iconic structures, 110 stories tall, with basically steel on the outside of them. You know the the uh, peripheral uh, facade was also made of steel, unlike other buildings. How were they? How did that come down? Um, and there were fires. And why did you know? Why did this? Why did page A three address this? Because they knew there was a lot of suspicion in the uh, in, in the public's mind at that point, and they had to uh, address that. And you know, where is the explanation as to why did all of the firefighters and all of these all of these trained experts? who were trained to fight high-rise high rise fires. We're talking about, you know, Manhattan, New York City fire departments. Why did they let all of their firefighters enter the building? You know, these are very courageous people, but they don't put themselves in danger, you know, knowing that there's a, you know, pop, yeah. I mean, they put themselves in danger, but not in the kind of danger where you know that the collapse would be imminent. That's where yeah. they sort of stop and say, holy shit, we can't go in there. Excuse my language. Um, but yet they all went in there anyway. None of this is addressed. Yep. So, you know, these that's the problem with that story. Yeah. With, you know, the, the cherry-picked experts, the elimination of other experts, the uh, ignoring what was being reported less than 24 hours later about explosions. All of that stuff is completely scrubbed from their explanation. And they end up with what NIST says. Well, you know, the plane sits, so the, the you know, it's obvious that the, the buildings were going to collapse. Yeah. Incredible. And, and the only... I mean, the only mm -hmm. thing they have going for them, I mean, if you really wanted to, again, think of every devil's advocate position would be, well, everybody who said explosions or whatever, they were actually just kind of hearing the, the, the dramatic sounds of the whole thing and the, the, you know, the fact that there had been so much force creating all these outward sort of um, plumes of smoke and so on and so forth. But yet, even within that, so even if you were to say, well, hey, you know, all these people... They thought it was explosions because their eyes deceived them or their ears deceived them, right? We still yeah. end up with uh, debris fields, mm -hmm. uh, pieces of debris that, that are you know hundreds of feet away and so on, which is what I'm offering to the audience here is just to say that the, this isn't as simple as we're just trying to take an eyewitness statement and say, well, they must have been right because they said it early on but that there are other details too that point towards um, explosion. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and you know, they, they, they didn't mention what people, uh, other people had seen or heard in that article. Um, and the people who came forward were not given a voice mm -hmm. on, on these kinds of platforms. You know, maybe, maybe we should take a look at what the actual uh, witnesses had to say. This is a really important clip, and and then you heard from far away, boom, boom, and you heard the boom, 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 boom. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like it was if, if they had detonated. Dead, yeah, dead, dead, they were planning yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. And it just started going pop. It just started going boom, 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 boom. And he goes, how fast? I go like firecrackers. And again, uh, to me, it's like if I'm actually in good faith looking for an explanation as to what happened and I have all the resources in the world, a.k.a. I'm the National Institute of, uh, what is it, Science and Technology, um, I would be... I, I would be looking for explosives, right? If that many people said that, right? That would be a good faith effort. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's correct. Uh, and you know, some of the, some of that testimony is is more provocative than others. But you you hear firefighters saying boom, 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 boom. Like yeah. it was yeah. almost like it was being you know detonated. Detonated. Um, yeah. Right. And uh, and 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 to be very clear. NIST says, and I, I think we should just sort of pop this on for, for the audience, um, this is coming from the report where they, they're saying explicitly that they found no corroborating evidence for alternative hypotheses suggesting that the World Trade Center towers were brought down by controlled demolition using explosives planted prior to September 11th. What do you mean? You have 
so many first responders saying that there were explosions. You have mainstream media reports saying that there were explosives. So that is um, not just disingenuous, it is uh, outright uh, false. Yeah. There was corroborating evidence, but they have the authority to say that there wasn't. And this is precisely the reason why they explain that they didn't find any evidence uh, evidence of explosives and when asked further did you look for any and they say no we didn't look for any because we didn't have to because there were no witnesses of explosions and there's no corroborating evidence other than the fact that the buildings looked exactly like they were being blown up you know <laughs> but you know it's orwellian honestly right so um what are the evidence of, of explosives so we just looked at the um the first-hand accounts but look at this map here joe and this is a map that was first printed in the Village Voice a few years after 9-11 when a, a Muslim group wanted to erect a mosque in Lower Manhattan and they faced resistance because people were saying, well, you know, it was Islamic terrorists that brought down the World Trade Center. We have to respect that. So the mosque that you're proposing must be at least further away from ground zero than human remains of victims. Yeah. And when you map out where the fire department found victims, uh, victim remains in, in terms of bone fragments, the furthest was 1,135 feet. Yeah. That's more than a fifth of a mile from ground zero. How do bone fragments go that far if these people all died from crush injuries? Yeah. It has to have been a uh, an explosive event. And moreover, I'll, I'll add that the New York Medical, New York City Medical Examiner, uh, he was published in the New York Times, uh, talking about the difficulty of doing forensics because there are body parts everywhere. He found one victim whose body uh, burst into 200 separate pieces. This is, these are not injuries from falling debris. Yeah. Yes, there was a lot of weight, but that smushes people. You know, sorry to be so graphic. It doesn't divide the human form into hundreds of pieces. Yeah. We're talking about not just energy, but energy density. How much energy is imparted to a given human being? Like, for example, if you were a, um, you know, a, uh, a wide receiver and you get decked by a, a tight end, um, that's a lot of force hitting you, but it doesn't wreck you. But if you were to concentrate all of that momentum into, say, a bullet, now you have a penetrating injury. So we're talking about energy imparted in a very, very uh, small cross-sectional area. In other words, energy density. That doesn't happen from crushes. That happens from explosive events. Yeah. Um, and look, this is the next thing I, I would like to uh, offer you. This is this is uh, my colleague David Chandler who put together this this um, video of the North Tower collapsing. And this has to do with sharpening your powers of observation. We we picked out some very interesting things with the with the picture of the North Tower collapsing, and then we saw the sequence. But look at how many things you can see if you watch it closely over and over again. And before we play this for your audience, I want to recall um, and remind us that in the few days after 9-11, all of the news uh, programming was showing you collapses of the Twin Towers. That was like all over the news. And then suddenly they decided that they weren't going to show us, show us these videos anymore uh, out of empathy for the uh, victims' families. They didn't want to trigger trauma. Yeah. Is that the reason <laughs> why they stopped showing it? Or is there another reason? Let's see what you, what you can see from just undisputed coverage taken from uh, a camera not so far away from the North Tower. The starting point in science is observation. What you are seeing here is what happened to the North Tower of the World Trade Center, the second of three buildings to collapse on 9-11-2001. I use the word collapse, but words can be deceptive. What do you really see happening here? 
There's a tremendous amount of falling debris, but under the canopy of debris, do you see the rapid sequence of explosive ejections of material? Some of the jets have been clocked at over 100 miles per hour. I will call them explosions because it's hard to find other words that describe what we are seeing here. The explosions are not isolated and few. They are continuous and widespread. They move progressively down the faces of the building, keeping pace with the falling debris. Perhaps you can imagine a natural cause, but I can't. Notice that the explosions are occurring on multiple floors at once, over a wide zone, not in a floor-by-floor -floor sequence that might be explained by pancaking collapse. Notice there are explosions far below the point of collapse. Some are isolated and focused. These are often referred to as squibs and are commonly seen in controlled demolitions. However, this is not a standard controlled demolition. The building is being progressively destroyed from the top down by waves of explosions, creating a huge debris field. The destruction is in waves, not just in one wave. Most obvious is a rapid sequence of explosions near the visible corner of the building. But simultaneously we can see another wave of explosions much further down the face of the building under the canopy of falling debris. Notice that both waves of explosions progress down the face of the building nearly keeping pace with the falling debris just a few feet away. Slabs of concrete did not fall to the ground and smash to dust. There is almost no concrete in the rubble pile. Notice that the concrete is being forcefully ejected outward from the sides of the building already pulverized to dust. Notice that embedded in the dust clouds are huge girders and entire sections of steel framing that are being hurled out of the building. The horizontal speed of some of the girders has been clocked at over 70 miles per hour. Some of these girders impale themselves in the sides of neighboring buildings. Some landed as much as two football fields away from the base of the tower. What could hurl heavy girders with such force and give them such speed? Some people have suggested that the weight of the tower crushing down on the girders caused them to flex, and they sprung sideways by a spring action. But we are not seeing isolated jumping girders. We are seeing a major fraction of the mass of the building, steel, concrete, office furniture, and the remains of human beings, reduced to small pieces of rubble and fine dust, and being explosively ejected in all directions. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, having the having the, the benefit of seeing this footage so many times over, um, it they point it out really well, though, in this particular clip, like, um, you clearly see that there's explosions, you, you clearly see that there are things that don't make any sense, um, in terms of the official explanation. And, and, and again, if I'm at the very least, this is the very least, if I'm if I'm the government, and I'm actually in good faith, trying to offer something, I'd be like, Oh, you know, Okay, it's clear that there's something else going on here. It's clear that there's explosives happening. And you could make this argument where it's like, well, well, maybe they didn't want to let people know that somehow the terrorists got in there and planted explosives because then they'd have to explain that security failure, right? So, so that justifies their lie. Do you know what I'm saying? But clearly, we're not being told the truth. Yes. So... Um... I'll start with what you just said there. Yeah, that would have been embarrassing. You know, how did the security let Al-Qaeda get into the building? But it leaves them with another big problem is why did they have to fly planes into the buildings? Yeah. If it was already set up for controlled demolition. Yeah. That would be, you can say, well, you know, security was lax, but why would they have to fly planes? I mean, this basically exposes what really happened because the planes obviously were the decoy. Mm-hmm. This allows them to, uh, to, to explain everything with plane collapses. But once you say that there were also explosives, now you're stuck. Yeah. Now the, you know, the true mechanism of collapses is revealed, and it also points to the level of power behind who engineered this event. Yep. Um, but to summarize what David Chandler said, first of all, material is being expelled laterally. Big, big parts of the building are going laterally where gravity moves in one direction, downward. Why are things being ejected hundreds of yards away that weigh four to eight tons? If clearly all of this material is being expelled outwardly as it falls, it's not available to crush the rest of the building. 
it's being dispersed. And possibly, and we see squibs, which are these, you know, small gaseous um, emissions that you often see or always see in controlled demolitions happening below the crush zone. And finally, perhaps uh, what's more, most remarkable here is what we saw initially when we looked at the, the frame as well as a, a, a cursory view of the North Tower coming down. There's nothing crushing the building. That part goes away in the first few seconds, and it's not there anymore. It, it completely debunks the NIST story of the structural block crushing the bottom part of the building. It's not there. Yeah. Okay. If, if that wasn't enough, um, we have Building 7, which we all know. I mean, we've talked about this many times, but it was not hit by a plane. It was the Solomon Brothers building... Uh, standing uh, 100, 100 yards away from the North Tower. And uh, it was 47 stories high, about 550, 550 feet tall, 400 feet wide. What was in that building? Well, beyond you know the controls, the nerve center of the um, uh, response team of Giuliani, Disaster Response Coordination Center, which was abandoned that morning for some reason, it also housed offices of uh, national security, the CIA, uh, Secret Service, and you know a lot of other peculiar things. And it went down on that day uh, at 5:20 p.m. And you know, I, I think it's worthwhile just to show this 30-second clip yep. of the uh, World Trade Center Seven coming down from several different vantage points. This, to me, was you know. We call it the red pill. It was a red pill for me. And when I saw that, I thought it was a building in Las Vegas going down, but it isn't. I was shocked to find out it happened on 9-11. And obviously, it's disquieting. I mean, when I first saw that, my stomach dropped. Yeah. Because that building is falling quickly. It is falling symmetrically. And it wasn't hit by a plane. And it looks relatively undamaged. That's the kind, it, it, it's falling like a house of cards, but this was a extremely well-built building. It was particularly uh, robust and it's falling at 95% the rate of gravity. In fact, the first two seconds were in free fall. If we estimate uh, that there was about 50,000 tons of steel in its structure, it's putting up no resistance, none. And the question is, how did NIST explain it? And I want to be very clear here, just like the Twin Towers, NIST didn't prove anything. They're just offering you a hypothesis yeah. because there was very little physical evidence to look at. There were no cameras in the building. They basically said that there, it was an unprecedented event where Column 79 uh, was dislodged from its supporting um, peripheral uh, beams from thermal expansion leading to the um, collapse of the building as um, adjacent columns were also involved, basically, is what they said. And so how did they prove their hypothesis? Well, they did the only thing that, that scientists could do after the building was basically, um, you know, removed and all of the materials were, uh, you know, on a fast boat to China. They built a model. And let's look at what the model looked like. So if their hypothesis is correct, what would we expect? We would expect that their model would look like what we saw. So let's play, let's play. This is, this is their actual uh, rendition of their model, which they took seven years to build. Yep. And, you know, the question is, did it look like what we saw? It didn't. You see, you know, um, uh, you see there was sort of a, a localized failure, which was the 70, uh, building uh, column 79, and some things around it started to fall, but the building didn't go down. It sort of crumpled to one side, and they, they don't show us what happened afterwards. And they say, shockingly, that it looked like the building. I mean, they're flat out telling you that that's what we saw. Yeah. That is not what we saw. 
I mean, if they were being honest, they would say, well, we need to go back to the drawing board because it didn't look anything like what we saw. Right. It looked like some parts of the building were collapsing before the others. It did not go flat. It didn't go straight down symmetrically. It crumpled around, you know, the area where they said the collapse sequence started. It did not look like what we, I mean, like you don't have to be a NIST engineer to see this. But as you know, um, there was an independent reinvestigation done by the University of Alaska Fairbanks Mm -hmm. and their civil engineering team reconstructed the computer model. And to verify that they did it correctly, they put in NIST's, NIST's hypothesis and they got exactly what NIST got. It looked nothing like what we saw but instead of NIST, they actually did an investigation, yeah. and they want to find out how many columns would have to fail in order to make the model look like what we observed. Yeah. And based on that, then you would have a hypothesis that was true. You would have some proof behind it. And let's look at what they found. They put in, you know, they kept putting in more and more columns, uh, and and varied when they would have to uh, fail and by how much. And this is what they got. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing here, um, you know, NIST's initial explanation and model clearly doesn't match at all the video that we're seeing at all um, Mm -hmm. what actually happened. And um, whereas this one does. Yes, this one looks exactly like what we saw you know, at least from the, from an untrained eye. Exactly. So if that's what their, if that's what their simulation showed us, I would say, okay, well, you, you know, you proved it, but it didn't. How many columns had to fall, fail in order to make this happen? The answer is all of them. Yeah. <laughs> and they had to fail synchronously and completely the internal columns failing completely causing the penthouse to collapse first. And then a few seconds later, all of the external columns had to fail synchronously. This cannot happen in a fire. And, you know, these experts, the civil engineering department there said ex- explicitly it was not caused by a fire. Yeah. It couldn't have been. So there we are. And if that wasn't enough, you know, this is something that came to my knowledge much later, um, was the the peculiarity of the fact that the Building 7 final report was not released until November of 2007. So six years, more or less, after they began their investigation, they couldn't tell us what happened. They told us what happened with the Twin Towers first, two years before, and it took them two more years. And, you know, they went on record saying that they're having, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a puzzle. It's difficult. We're having a hard time getting our heads around what happened to Building 7. And they came up with this faulty explanation, which they proved themselves were was wrong. They have proved, but their hypothesis is wrong because their model did not do what we saw. And then, you know, end of story. However, that morning and that early in that afternoon, there was widespread uh, uh, coverage of foreknowledge of that building going down. And this is a very interesting clip um, of the assistant uh a uh, fire chief in Manhattan who is being interviewed on 60 Minutes talking about what happened that day. And he is telling us that experts on the ground were telling the fire department that the building's collapse was imminent. How did these people on the ground know no. that the building was going to come down? I think it's you know worthwhile taking the uh, 45 seconds or so to just listen to what he's saying. He's saying, well, you know, uh, we knew it was coming down and the experts there, the, this unnamed engineer was right on the money because he predicted, predicted five hours. And that's exactly how long the building, uh, stood until it came down, uh, catastrophically. Why didn't NIST ask this prescient engineer what he knew? The deputy chief of the New York Fire Department that day remembers the scene. Well, we had uh, our special operations people set up surveying instruments to monitor and see if there was any movement of the building. Uh, we were concerned of the possibility of collapse of the building. And we had a discussion with one particular engineer there, and we asked him if we uh, allowed it to burn, uh, could we anticipate a collapse? And if so, how soon? 
and it turned out that he was pretty much right on the money that he said uh, in his current state about you have about five hours. And it's interesting because, you know, you go back to it and it's like, where is, and maybe, maybe there is an article somewhere of the mainstream media talking to this deputy dude. Um, mm -hmm. but I doubt it. And yet, you know, the, the, from a journalistic point of view, that would be a really fascinating story, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the stuff and again, I, this, obviously our channel is in no way in, in like on Trump's side by any means, but it, this is more of an observation, but it's like, you know, if you had a, a, a some random person come out and say, well, you know, I saw, you know, Trump, uh, do this thing where, you know, he, uh, you know, I got this picture of him with like, uh, you know, a, a rip down the back of his pants, you know, the New York times would be all over it. Like, Oh, look at this, look at this happened. Well, you know, they'd be given stories all day long to this yet. You have something as major as this <laughs> draws really into question what actually happened. And, you know, they're nowhere. And I think this is what the public is so confused about 9-11. I shouldn't say that. They're not confused about 9-11. They should be. Um, yep. And they're, they're, they're not confused because they're just not being given the information and they have no idea how much is out there that it, it's not like you have to reach, like there's no reaching to, you know, these wild conspiratorial uh, conclusions. You're just literally looking. It's like all of this all of this fact, all of this information is just not being conveyed. So of course, how are you supposed to have any clue when, when nothing's being conveyed? Right. And, um, Very difficult. this but is a failure of media. Yeah. Well, you know, to contextualize this, I have to say that, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, um, was already very suspicious of what we were being told, um, because I didn't suffer from the same delusion that many of my physician colleagues had, which is, they would never do anything bad to us. Right. Um, and that's chiefly because of my investigation into 9-11. Like once you understand that, once you understand that they can blow up three buildings in Manhattan on a sunny Tuesday morning and get away with it, they can get away with anything they want to. Yep. So this is why, again, you know, 9-11 is easy to see. It's very difficult to see really what happened with the pandemic, honestly. If you, you know, for a lay person, you have to go very deep into data and analysis and compare and contrast what people are saying and, you know, point out the inconsistencies and arguments about vaccine efficacy and mortality rates and blah, 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 blah. But this is simple. It's, I mean, for, for years, right? It's, you know, I actually learned about 9-11 even before I started CE. Um, it was in 2005, 2006 that I started to realize, okay, there's something seriously wrong here. And, um, and, but you know, it, it kind of is in the back of your mind. Right. But then when I started CE in 2009 and, you know, we had the opportunity to platform a lot more of these conversations and just to see the, uh, sort of the denial is unbelievable. And, you know, like I, I write about this in my upcoming book and I'll, you know, there's a little plug for it, but I talk about, and I'll just use this as an example because I think this is important. I talk about the subject of chemtrails or geoengineering. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course, this this is a, a subject that for those of us and I would put C in that group that covered this properly over the years that covered this subject yeah. with with evidence, with rigor that we cared about it, the truth, blah, 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 which which meant we're not just saying, oh, look, here's some pictures of ballasts on a plane. This is the ballast that carry the chemicals that are spraying in the sky. No, no, we weren't going in that <laughs> direction. We were saying, hey, here's all the scientific analyses. Here's the, the different uh, experts that have come out talking about this, so on and so forth. And the, the prospect was, hey, they're, they're flying planes up in the sky. I don't know what planes they are. No idea what planes they are, but they're, they're spraying something that is clouding the sky. This is so clearly happened. Use your eyes. It's happening. And it was, yep. no, that's a conspiracy. No, that's nonsense. Conspiracy, conspiracy. Now, and for the last four or five years, you can go right on mainstream media and they talk about how, you know, the plans for climate, you know, uh, change in this sense is we're going to take planes, we're going to go up in the sky and we're going to spray stuff, different specific chemicals to, to, to reflect the sun. You think, what's more realistic that... All of us who were told we were conspiracy theorists and crazy 
that the government had never even concocted this idea and it never existed and this was a complete we were all just completely wrong all these years or and that and then now all of a sudden they got this idea probably from all of us who made it up right or mm -hmm. they've been doing and testing this for decades yep. without telling the public and now they're admitting it which one's more likely right and and i think yep. nine this is a, the same thing with this subject is it's all out there Mm -hmm. It's just not being mm -hmm. discussed and it's being denied. And I, I think this is a really important thing for people to consider is that there's going to come a time where, okay, this is all self-evident at some point, but yep. it, it could be faster if you stop and take a look. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, good for you. And I'm looking forward to your book. Uh, um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and here's where, you know, we can go much further into, into like, you know, um, looking at how to contextualize this 9-11 event. And, you know, first of all, I would like to say that morning, um, you know, this could be obviously very provocative, but, you know, we heard all of the mainstream media talking about explosive events, and then suddenly everything went silent uh, around those things soon after the buildings went down. And that almost... Uh, coincided with a very provocative interview done by BBC that morning. And they interviewed uh, former Prime Minister uh, Ehud Barak, Prime Minister of Israel, um, at around 11.30 on BBC. That was just a half an hour after, uh, an hour after uh, the North Tower came down, and he was contextualizing what this event meant. And, you know, I, I think we all know what he said. It was like, look, we're in a new world now. This was a clearly a terrorist attack. We know who the um, culprits or most likely culprits are. He did not name bin Laden, but he named exactly who you'd expect him to name. You know, rogue states like Iraq, North Korea, um, you know, Libya, and of course, Iran. Like, let's be real, folks. This is what's going on, and we're living in a new world. Um, and... Interestingly, the uh, the chair, the executive director of the 9-11 Commission uh, was Philip Zelikow. And Philip Zelikow also was the, a commissioner of the COVID-19 Commission Planning Group. I mean, this guy is involved with the, the spin around these events. He is a player, and he was also someone who wrote about a potential event like 9-11 three years earlier in 1998 in a very provocative um, uh, piece, which he co-authored called uh, Catastrophic Terrorism, Tackling the New Danger, where he said, look, at some point there's going to be an event, a catastrophic a event that's going to change the world, and our government will be forced to take matters into their own hand with respect to uh, freedoms and surveillance, and they will be judged based upon their... Um, uh, their effort to keep the country safe. I mean, he is, tr you know, telegraphing this event three years before it happens. Then he becomes a 9-11 uh, executive director of the 9-11 Commission Report. And then, you know, uh, 20 years later, now he is the uh, commissioner of the 9-11 uh, COVID-19 uh, Commission Planning Group for this country. This guy is not what I would call an objective observer. Yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, and as we know, 9-11 saw within a few days the uh, institution of the Patriot Act, which made all of these things happen. The Patriot Act was initially crafted in 1994 or 5 after the um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma building um, destruction, um, which was written by President Biden. And um, in, in that form was revised and uh, put into action after 9-11. And it gives an enormous amount of power to the U.S. government in terms of its provisions. And chiefly, it started to lay down how this country was going to respond to terrorist threats, including extraordinary rendition and the ability to detain people uh, based on suspicion alone. Yeah. This potentially was the greatest um, threat to freedom in this country. 
and it came about because of 9-11. Anyway. Yeah. What do you have to say? Yeah, I mean, the in a the problem with our world, I think, when it comes to sense making, is people do this, right? They they look at a singular event and they try and say, well, here's all the other possible explanations, and you're like, well, yeah, of course, there's all these other possibilities that that could be, and, and you're right, it's good to ask those questions, um, but at the same time you have to bring in all the details of kind of how we know power operates sometimes, right? And false flags, there's no secret that false flags have been used throughout the course of history going as far back as the Roman Empire and all these different places. People use, or I should say people of positions of power use events, whether true or fabricated, to create public buy-in for something that has to do with the geopolitical sort of uh, movement or agenda or whatever it might be. This is There's nothing about this that is new. This has been going on for as long as time. And when you consider that, you have to, th you have to think to yourself, there's two possibilities. Either you live in this sort of free country, free world, and all of this stuff, all of this geopolitical lying has just gone away. That just doesn't happen anymore. The, you know, the conspirituality folks kind of fall into that um, sort yeah. of camp, right? Or mm -hmm. it's that this stuff that's been happening forever is still happening. And you have to now start to identify, wait a minute, we have an entire world where the, insistem the incentive structures are set up to say, yeah, this is the thing to do if you want more power, if you want more geolit geopolitical control, this is what you're supposed to do. So while you're right. in real time, you need to be able to ask the question, where is this happening now? Right? Yeah. Where is this happening now? And, and unfortunately, there's the narrative control around that is you're a conspiracy theorist, right? If you ask that you're a conspiracy, theorist. if you're a historian and you say, well, look at all these obvious conspiracies that have existed, that's okay. You're a historian, but in real right. time, no, you're, you're scum of the earth. Right. And I think that's, this is where people are being duped by, um, to, to, to avoid common sense. And, uh, it doesn't mean, and I think this is, you know, step number one for you. It doesn't mean you suddenly are like, oh yeah, well, they're lying to us. Here's the truth. I know it. It just means when you embrace the uncertainty, you also hold some of your conclusions loosely as you move forward, right? Like you come to a better explanation, but you hold it loosely and there's nothing wrong with that. Right? But, um, uh, you know, those are my feelings. I agree with you. Yes. Nothing to add there. You know, we're at a great place right now. As as much as it seems like the world is pulling us apart, pulling people apart, and it's becoming impossible to understand what's going on, it's also fertile ground for the truth to emerge. Because the lies are so unbelievably um, obvious, um, and so even though you know nine eleven was talked about for many many years by very very good. Uh, uh, spokespersons. Now the public, I hope, is starting to loosen their understanding, as you said, and availing themselves of the clear evidence of a 9-11 conspiracy. And this, uh, I, I can't overstate the importance of this because um, it's easy to see and it's also very powerful and it's also, you know, it changed the world completely. And once you can understand and accept that that's what happened, now you have a, a, a clearer set of lenses to examine what's going on right now. There's no doubt, uh, you know, whenever I'm really confronted with uh, the uh, uncertainty around what's going on, it always, it's always 9-11 that brings me back to, well, yes, something that bad and that nefarious could actually have happened because of 9-11. They did that, whoever they are, they can do anything they want to. Yeah. So don't don't throw something away because it seems preposterous. It's probably more likely that than not that it is actually in play if things don't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Um, you know, there's a there's an element of our humanity that that gets lost. Um, and a lot of this stuff, as we as we look to find 
you know, the certainty and being right or whatever it might be. And there's an element of like, what is, why, why are we even questioning? Where is this leading? And then what's the best yeah. sort of strategy? Like if we're, you know, for me, it's, it's always been, I want to create a better world. And in order to create a better world, you have to change the way power works right now. And then the incentive structures of systems, and then the way that humanity is being pulled away from its nature, and then being convinced that what we're doing now is its nature, right? And and all of that is involved. So what serves to get there, right? Um, does bickering and you know fighting each other and you know calling one set of people evil while the others are good or whatever it might be, does that help? I mean, I don't know. That's for people to answer. But I think that is a reasonable place to start as well. Is just like why why what are we what are we moving towards because um, mm -hmm. if it's just vengeance and revenge then yeah you're probably going to end up in a pretty shitty place <laughs> like you know fighting fighting people yep. to to seek vengeance and revenge but if there's a vision of right. something better then that's a, a different story yes we need to hold that in front of us and understand that that's what we're uh, trying to achieve here and we all have a role to play here you know you've got a platform I don't have a platform, but you know, luckily I get to be on platforms like yours. But we all are in some way playing a part in this, and we have to use our abilities, the ones that we've been given, uh, correctly. And you know, we've hit upon um, diffusing animosity. And you know, it's very sad for me to to watch people bicker about this. Um, and get into discussions on social media and debates. And, um, you know, th there's a couple of things I'd like to offer here as advice as we move forward, especially if you don't have a platform. And the first thing is, if you are disagreeing with someone on social media, don't try, don't expect them to be, to concede that you're right and they're wrong. They're never going to do that. That's not the objective of engaging with people on those kinds of platforms. The objective is to, to demonstrate to the audience who is observing this exchange that your argument is better than theirs. And it's not, you know, people are, are very often not able to know, they'll come to their own conclusion about what, what argument is better, but they're more apt to listen to you if you comport yourself better. So if they're swearing at you and denigrating you, you don't have to stoop to their level. You know, walk away from it or just say, look, we can disagree or, you know, calmly respond to the facts. We want to, in order to, you know, in order to win this thing, we have to be um, of higher vibration. And, you know, stooping to the level is not the way of being of higher, higher vibration. Um, secondly, you have to be very careful about what you are asserting is true because all... Just like you see the other side throw the baby away with the bathwater, um, you, you're making that happen if you're offering something that is not true. And so you have to be it's like stick with the stuff that you absolutely know is certain, and don't necessarily you don't have to give them ten reasons why you should believe them if if four of them may not be so true. Yeah. Keep those out of there. You don't need those other four. Go with the six that are absolutely certain. That's a you know a mistake that we all make um, because there are many things that you and I didn't talk about today uh, for a reason because the evidence behind them is not 100% factual. The stuff we gave you here is factual. Using the word truth, I think, is a problem because science is the ever-ending search for truth. Don't assume that you have the truth. You don't necessarily have the truth. Every, you know, every scientist that comes up with uh, a new discovery is expecting it to be overturned at some point when new information comes around. So asserting that, you know, I, I, I'm a voice of truth, I think that's wrong. I understand what you mean by that, but what we're trying to offer people is clarity. Can you approach this with an unbiased lens to see clearly and then see what emerges? That's the best that we can offer. Um, let's see, what else is there? You know, these are the kinds of things that, that uh, you know, often get missed on our side and are absolutely essential for, for, for uh, helping us move forward. Yeah. And so we don't want to undermine our own purpose here. I think the other big one is the dehumanization piece. And, and you know, this has always been the, the big one that we've always pointed out is like, 
stop dehumanizing or at least even get curious about why you're dehumanizing people that disagree with you. Um, you know, the, mm -hmm. the sheeple, the, the sleepers, the, the non pure bloods, the, all, all the garbage that people come up with. Um, mm -hmm. why, like, where did, what is that about? Like, why are we so quick to dehumanize? I mean, if we, if we look at the paradoxes, if we look at the ways in which, you know, you often have the things we complain about from the mainstream where it's like dehumanizing people that think differently or, um, you know, trying to, to create animosity towards the, the, the free thinkers in society. So, you know, so we're called, and we don't like that division and it's, we want to call it out in the mainstream yet, you know, in the alternative side or in the free thinking side or however you want to frame it, the same stuff's going on. Right. And, and so there is a level of, of what I call, and I'll say it outright is becoming a high quality individual. Like what is yep. the, what is the behavior of being a high quality individual and how do you commit to that and not start dehumanizing your enemy and not start dehumanizing people that, um, that think differently than you. And, and if that's hard to do and there's a resistance there, great. There's the inner work, um, that, that kind of shows you what might be going on within yourself. Right. And instead of blaming your own held animosity on somebody being stupid, let's say, you know, look, look inside, right? See what, what really bothers you. And I think that's one of the biggest missing pieces in the space is there's not a lot of commitment to the inner work, the inner transformational part of, of all of this. Yeah. Well said that is this, you have to start with yourself first. You know, we talk about this in our overcoming bias, like don't worry about their biases. Look at your own bias first. That's yeah. a, a lot of internal work there. Um, and, the more clear-headed people we have on the planet, the more uh, chance we have of hastening a, a a real collective evolution. Oh, bingo, bingo! What a word, or what I should say, what what two words put together? Yeah. Alrighty. Well, do you have anything else to add here? Probably. Probably. But I can't think of it. <laughs> I'll, I'll save it for next year at our twenty-fourth anniversary of nine eleven. Yeah. Let's see where we're going here. I, th I think things are moving very, very quickly. I mean, things are coming apart like on a daily basis right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and I'll, a little plug for my man Bobby here. You know, he, he tweeted a, a couple of months ago around 9 11, um, basically saying that there are questions around that event. He hasn't, you know, said it's a conspiracy or anything like that, but. His point was very interesting. He was like, look, if you're worried about conspiracy thinking, you have to have transparency. Yeah. That's the way to face it. You don't, you don't, you know, muzzle these people. You provide more speech. You provide more information. You have to provide transparency. And that's what we're looking to do here. And I think things are, you know, when we have people like that um, at, at his uh, stature uh, politically, and publicly saying things like that, that's really important. You don't have to agree with everything he says. You don't have to vote for him or, you know, whatever, but he's making some really important points. All of it has to do with like transparency, health, um, you know, finding the value in family and the environment and uh, all of these things. And this is why I'm very hopeful. Yeah. Well, I mean, bingo, bango, well said. And, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of this just comes back to uh, the bits that we said at the end are all great places to start of really just creating the conditions within the beings so that the beings can navigate the landscape, the conversation and so on and so forth uh, better. And that's kind of kind of the upgrade here. Um, but as always, great layout of stuff here. Um, I think there's a lot to consider. If you've watched this, please, you know, share this with somebody, uh, open up a conversation, you know, see what uh, somebody has to say. And um, yeah, that's it. That's all. If you have anything else to add, let me know. If not, thanks so much. Thank you, Joe. All right.